All right, hello. My name is Felix, and I'm going to talk about building simulators. What simulators are, what blocks go in a simulator, and how does one use a simulator. So building simulators is something that we do at MHWERT, an international engineering company with headquarters in Norway. And what the company does is producing equipment, equipment from, or, or for oil and gas, essentially drilling equipment and connected equipment and services around that equipment. So what you see on the screen is different kinds of equipment that we produce, drilling, pipe holding, mud mixing, and all the different machines that exist there on the rig. And that is for petroleum industry. And the life cycle in the petroleum industry spans many phases. You go from exploration to discovery, to development, production, and then eventually to decommissioning. And this is, of course, a huge undertaking. In no way this is a one man's job. So there are companies that have to work together on various parts of that cycle and various parts of the technology stack in order to make that drilling and operation happen. Talking about the areas where operation take place and where equipment exists. There's, of course, the top side on the drilling ship, on the drilling rig, where the actual drilling equipment stands. Then there's subsea, where pipes are, and on the sea bottom there's uh, equipment, subsea equipment standing, like blowout preventers and such, and subsurface. So three areas, top side, subsea, and subsurface, and subsurface, that's where the actual drilling happening. And all of the three areas we have to work with this equipment in all of three of them. Simulation is, of course, many things, and it is a big field. One can think of fluid simulation, health modeling, and all the different disciplines that's coming there. But something that is closer to what we are doing and something that is somewhat related is, for example, structure deformation simulation, when there's a certain design uh, that you put together in your CAD for mechanical parts. Uh, that is something you could then put into the simulation software to test for strain, depending on the pressure, temperature, and different conditions that this part, this part will experience throughout the lifetime, maybe a few years. So that is something that could be simulated, and of course the results uh, you can accommodate for in your design. Different sides of related simulation is dynamic process simulation. This is when gas and fluid processes can be simulated, for example, for hydraulics. As hydraulic movement is in no way linear, when you open a valve, there's a certain way by which pressure builds up, and there is certain software, such as this Simulation X, for example, which allows you to De define those cylinders, those hydraulic parts, uh, and then simulate how the pressure will build up and how the equipment or the movements will behave. In this example, this is a combustion engine when you can simulate the movement of the pistons. Another part that is also sort of applicable towards oil and gas is uh, downhole process modeling. Uh, when you do simulate what happens underneath in the geology layers. So this is where you have your drill string throughout thousands of meters, feet in this example, and then you analyze for the uh, rate of penetration, the depth, uh, the weight on beat, all the different parameters that happen throughout the drilling, um, as well as simulating or measuring, measuring porosity, density, and other properties of the medium. But while all of those are different kinds of modeling simulation, we will be focusing in this talk more on the training kinds of simulation, similar to what, for example, flight simulation in training is doing. This is when you have uh, operators, the pilots in this case, uh, working with the actual equipment, so the actual controls, and an instructor that is probably seated behind them and introduces some scenarios. So. There is, of course, the gaming ki kind of flight simulators where you are just having the software and potentially some of the controls and the actual training where there is a focus on the actual hardware, the actual control being used. And while some of the simulation bits that I've mentioned, they exist in here, uh, 
there's a big focus on physics, on the actual kinematics of the objects moving and interacting in 3D space, and the visuals. So you have to address those two parts as well, and that's something we will talk about. So why is simulation needed for oil and gas? Um, if you look at the cost of production that has been rising throughout the last decades, and it has gone up significantly since, for example, 1960s. So there's a whole gap of efficiency that we have to cover. And why are the costs rising? Of course, there are many reasons behind that. Uh, one of them is, for example, regulations of work. As costs of human life and human injury has gone significantly up, throughout the last decades, and governments are putting forward laws on health, safety, and environment to address that, which results in much, much better health and safety while working in those dangerous conditions offshore or onshore. Uh, this results uh, somewhat in more people being involved, as you have now to phase out your work, in structured work, work orders, which also kind of introduces delays and waiting periods before the working area is safe and secure and you have to involve more technology. This is one of the reasons uh, of why the costs are going up. The other one is complexity of the fields in development. If we are looking at the Norwegian continental shelf, uh, well, there's, well, there's the North Sea, the Norwegian, and then the Barents Sea on the top. And as time goes, we tend to develop and already deploy the easy fields, the fields to the south, and we have to go for more challenging conditions up north. And that means quite severe wind, waves, uh, extreme temperatures that we have to operate with, and of course, uh, depths that are uh, larger than the ones we used to operate. And this is not something uh, just in Norway. This happens globally, as it's global fields that we tend to develop already and deplete the fields that are easier to access. So we go for the challenging areas. How do we address the existing challenges? It's not that the regulations can be lifted. One of the ways to do that is to use simulation. Simulation for providing better training so the personnel is more prepared for the operations. Simulation to support the actual operations and give you more control in operations. So the simulation installation that, for example, we are producing is taking the authentic actual drilling chairs for the operators and putting them into the simulated environment when you have a hemispherical dome screen with projection of the insides of the drillers' cabin. So the drillers, while they are being situated on the rig in the drillers' cabin, this is the virtual drillers' cabin that they operate within. So typically there are two, there's a driller and assistant driller that switch between the equipment and modes of operation and steer it throughout the certain sequence. Driller is usually handling the operations connected to the actual drilling process, which is connecting the pipes, getting them down, applying the uh, weight on the drill bit with the drilling machine, while the assistant driller is helping him in the process and providing, for example, the drilling material, uh, assisting with the mud pumps and getting the pipes from the pipe stand. And then again, these are the three areas that we have to work with, topside, subsea, and subsurface. So we have equipment in all of these three areas, and we have to simulate the equipment in all of the three areas. Topside, this is where the equipment stands on the drill floor. Subsea, blowout preventers, the riser pipes, subsea templates and manifolds that stand there, and subsurface, where the drill bit is. And there's amazingly little communication in between those areas, but still there is when we're talking about the real life. Um, there has been attempts to establish wired connection from all the way down there and this is uh, hundreds and uh, thousands of meters, to the top side. And, but that has not yet led to um, mainstream adoption of such methods. Uh, what we are dealing with is 
instruments that are installed with the drilling bit, they're doing the measurements and they send the signals through vibrations in the drilling fluid. So all of what they have measured, they are passing with the impulses through the drilling fluid and those vibrations, they rise and eventually you will capture them, analyze and record on the top side. So there is communication in between, but the bandwidth is of course rather low. So before we start on the simulation bit, let's take a look at what is it we are going to simulate and take a piece of equipment. This, an example, is a hydraulic roughneck, a machine that is there on the drill floor on the top side. Roughneck used to be a title of a person who connected the pipes on the drill floor with chains. And while that position went, there's now a robot for that function, as probably there's now a robot for every function that used to be manual back then. So hydraulic roughneck, as in the name, is the machine for connecting the pipes and tightening them or disconnecting them. As you can see, it is equipped with um, rails so that it can move throughout on the drill floor, on the predefined paths. It has the motors to move its arms around and the sensors when it needs to touch something, sense the environment. So the hardware is the motors and the sensors. It is operated remotely, so it's a remote, remotely operated robot. It is steered from the driller's cabin by the driller or by one of the drillers. And the driller has the visual contact usually with the HRN just because it's just outside of the driller's cabin. So he sees the equipment and he also has a number of CCTV, the video cameras installed on the rig so he can observe the operation from various angles. And HRN is not the only piece of equipment. There are typically 15 to 20 pieces just of drilling related pieces of equipment on the rig and not all of them are in direct sight from the driller's cabin. So this is why having those cameras is important. Roughneck, the hydraulic roughneck, is not a blunt tool. It's not uh, that. A movement of a joystick leads dire dire directly to movement. It has a CPU as there's a number of logic put into that CPU. So CPU is, in this example, a programmable logic controller, a piece of hardware having the logical circuits for that roughneck. So this is something that is installed in the server room on the rig. And this is the piece of hardware designed for real-time operation. This is when you use the real-time operation operative system to run operations in a real-time manner, meaning that you probably know that real-time operation is that when you have a fixed time frame for providing a response in critical, life-critical operations and life-critical uh, hardware, you would need to have a fixed time frame for processing all the inputs, calculating all the needed internal values and providing the output. And Typically, well, let's say this is within 30 milliseconds. So there's a fixed time frame within which all the calculations should be done and output should be given. And the next cycle is started right, right after that. So by the life critical nature of this operation, it has to be a real time CPU that drives the roughneck. Because otherwise, if it's not capable of computing all of the outputs within the time frame, this could lead to potentially a dangerous situation. So in case there's a failure in this, there's an emergency shutoff being issued, so the machine stops. As for programming those logic controllers, this is when you use a type of software called control system software. So in this example, this is step seven programming. Control system software is using those languages designed specifically for deploying into real-time hardware. And this is where you define those logical circuits, how to process and what inputs and what outputs should be given. Basically what inputs from driller should be processed, what inputs from sensor should be processed, what internal states should be updated, and what valves and electrical current should be sent where in terms of driving its actions further. 
And it's not just the controlled mode of operations, there is also assisted and automatic mode of operation. As there are pre-programmed logical paths with decision making that, for example, when it goes into a certain area and there's a command to spin in the pipes, to grab the pipes, it goes following a predefined path and it senses the pipe, then it closes the arm and then it uh, retracts back. So there's a bunch of different modes and it's not just a call to action. There's a bit of logic put inside. The control systems, they are connected to their motors and sensors. So motors and sensors, the, uh, it's the arms when it comes to the motors and legs, and eyes and ears for the control system. So this is how it's sensing the environment and interacting with the environment. Control systems have to interact with each other because no operation is a single machine operation usually. So they have to exist on this highly performant industrial network. Profinet, Profibus are one of the similar ones and talk to each other in terms of what stage of operation is being performed at the moment and how do they cooperate because sometimes they have to move synchronously on different phases just to complete something and do a complex handling operation from several sides. And then all of that is brought to the human machine interface. This is when the drillers interact with the machines they steer them with joysticks or at least allow them to proceed to the next operation with the controls, switch the modes of operation for an equipment as one equipment could be capable of uh, performing very different types of handling and switching the machines. There are two drillers and there's 15 to 20 machines that they have to operate, even in pre-programmed ways. So topology. Topology is that the control systems are on this industrial high performance network and control system, each of them, is connected to its equipment. So the brain is connected to the body, sensors and motors in this case. Now that we have seen how the equipment is operated, how do we take it from here to the simulated environment? This is when we take the original control systems, the brains, and we put them into a simulated environments, connecting them to virtual sensors and virtual motors. Eventually we are fooling the control system. It is not aware that it's taken away from the actual rig. It's still f sensing what the sensors are sensing. It's still able to move and feel the feedback from the movement as it, in resistance. But it's not there on the rig anymore. It's in our server room on shore and it's connected to the virtual world representing all the signals and all the movements. Topology-wise, there are a few challenges in here. First off, you have to connect two very different in principle networks. You have to connect the industrial network, designed for real-time fast operation, and simulation network, which is hosting the usual Windows and Linux machine on an Ethernet connection. So you have to bridge those, and you have to mine the performance as well, as there might be hundreds and thousands of signals in real-time flowing back and forth. And remember that control system is expecting to hear from you, from you within that time frame. Otherwise, it will issue an emergency shot of others as it doesn't hear from one or two of its sensors or it can't initiate a motor. So you have to match that on your other parts of the network. Um, next thing you have to do is have to bridge. You have to bridge the language of control system, which is voltages and open close valves to, well, let's say TCP and UDP packets on Ethernet. We don't do voltages on Ethernet. So we have to do that translation. You have to acquire those voltages, those commands, and translate them. Uh, and it's not a simple translation in there, as you would have to probably do a bit of simulation on the low level. When a valve is open and hydraulic pressure is building up, as we spoke, it's not linear, so you'll probably have to do a bit of simulation for the hydraulic movements and the linear uh, linear to curvature movement that happens in there. And that could, could be a whole subsystem with hydraulic simulation. When topology is done, and well, say you've taken out the control system, you will have to introduce your machines in your virtual world. And to do that, you'll have to take their shapes, the actual buildup of machines. And the actual buildup of machines is being drawn in CAD packages, computer-aided design 
So all the designs are being done in 3D these days. And those are the designs meant for fabrication. Once you've sketched your machine, you would send it and it's f tested your in, in the CAD itself, you're able to produce that. So send that for fabrication. And what we want to do is to get the very same machine or the very same design that is sent to fabrication and put it to the simulator so that we would have the very same shape and the very same behavior. Uh, the tricky part in here is that the CAD designs, they are typically very detailed. So they have high level of detail and lots of uh, small parts that usually would complicate real-time performance of a real-time 3D rendering. So there's a whole number of approaches in the industry of how to convert the CAD model into something that is real-time 3D friendly. And sometimes it's just manual remodeling of the very same in a lower detail level. Sometimes it's the conversion when you can convert one to the other. And sometimes you can implement support in your software so your simulation software can support the source CAD formats and eventually have that bridging working. If the equipment that you have to simulate comes from pre-digital era when the models in 3D did not exist, then you would have probably to go offshore and use of those, one of those uh, very performant 3D scanners to get a model of a uh, certain equipment and put it in 3D afterwards. So it's possible to get a model when it doesn't exist in your drawings. So that is for the shape of it and that is for the source where the model comes from. If you want to simulate it, if you wanted to move it around, then you would have to introduce the physical part. And the physical part, um, this is the actual simulated environment. This is the environment taking the stimuli and providing some feedback, something that the control system expects for its operation. It's uh, important to note that it is different from graphics. As in this example, this is not the pixelated Mario that does the collisions and uh, the weight or standing on the planes. It's his invisible brother comprising of two circles with a center of mass, as you see, um, which is the collision primitive actor for Mario. So the physical model, it is something that is coarser that has to coexist in the very same coordinates. It's invisible, but that's the actor that is doing all the physical interactions in the scene. And this is the standard approach. This is the collision primitives that build up that actor. This is the collision primitives uh, that are coarser versions and those are physics computation friendly versions of the model of your asset. And then you would have the center of mass, friction, weights of different shapes and all the other properties connected to the physics with that invisible a physical actor. While the graphical representation, visual representation could be quite nice, and this is bridge crane arm if I'm not mistaken, the physics, if they're superimposed on top, they would show the coarser model that is taking part in the collisions and the physical interactions. This is a separate world from graphics. You would usually work with two worlds at the same time. You would do all the physical interactions and all the collisions in the physical world and just flush the coordinates for the graphics uh, to follow. So graphics is not there for the collisions and such. Um, this is when you talk shapes, whether those are boxy shapes, cylinder shapes, capsules, sometimes even meshes. Joints between those shapes, whether those are rigid joints or flexible joints, for example, a hinge having one degree freedom and forces. The only th way things could move in a physical world, this is by applying forces. So behind the scene, there's a physical engine, physics kinematics engine, processing equations. And those equations are processed on a certain frame per second. It is important that if your simulation is accurate, if you want it to be behaving realistically, if you're using one of the industrial physics kinematics engines, then your physical FPS is probably higher than your graphical FPS, just because the requirements for those equations is to be resolved on a regular basis, very, very little t time frame, so that there's enough uh, time to stabilize 
your equations. Otherwise, what might happen is instability. Instability in physics is a case when the equations can't really be resolved within the provided time frame. So what happens is that there's a buildup of forces that eventually your scene explodes or leads to other visual effects. This is very known and we've all witnessed it in gaming and especially that is crucial when you're trying to do a simulation of the uh, equipment. So this is an effect when it's either that you have configured your scene non a correct way or uh, your time frame for simulating and resolving these equations is quite small so that the physical equations can't get resolved and the forces are just building, building up. This often reacts in uh, parts of your scene shooting away and forces building up to a significant proportion. Talking about physics and kinematics, this is the typical codes and typical terms that you would use. You would have some constraints of the joints, limitations of the joints. You would have the transformations, the coordinates, translations, and then you would have, of course, forces and motors to move things around. So we've built the physical part. Graphics. Talking about graphics and picture rendering output, let's have a line of separation between representation, how your model is stored, and visualization, how the model is sent to the graphical device. Uh, this example is um, ComputerCraft. If you haven't seen it, it's a brilliant mod for Minecraft when you can actually program computers within Minecraft world. So this guy designed a whole 3D engine inside Minecraft in one of those computers in this mod. Brilliant. And what he's using for this 3D engine is, of course, triangular representation, which is the classic way of representing objects, is when you break complex surfaces into triangles. And the way you store them is each individual triangle, because that is much simpler to send for visualization. And that simplifies the maths that you have to do when it comes to visualization of those. So each of the complex surfaces is represented as a number of triangles. So while triangulations is one of the ways to store the models, there's still the parametric representation, which could be constructive solid geometry, Boolean operations on the shapes, or just analytical representations of your curves, being the splines and the surfaces built up of those splines. This representation is, of course, more compact to represent and to store. Think of a cylinder that you have to represent with triangles. Then you would have to build up the triangles and store three coordinates, three vectors uh, for each of the triangles for everything that is on the two caps and on the sides. So this is quite a significant amount of data just for one cylinder and depending on how much detailization you want in that cylinder. And compare that to an analytical representation when, in order to represent a triangle, what you have to do is have the point of origin, radius, one number, height, and potentially one vector for orientation. So much, much more compact and much easier to transfer from A to B when it comes to analytical representation. The downside is, of course, that it's not straightforward to visualize as the modern-day GPUs, they're meant for triangular representations and they're much more effective with those and it's not a predefined approach on those GPUs to render analytical or parametric surfaces. Well, let's say we've defined our models, the representation is there and then we have to visualize. Traditional approach is of course rasterization, something that you've heard. Uh, this is what is built in into the GPUs. GPUs are very optimized for that. So what GPUs are doing for rasterization is that everything is built with triangles, easy. They're taking each an individual triangle and they have your viewer's plane or viewer's position in the 3D world. They do a matrix transformation onto that viewer, viewer's plane. So they're essentially getting a screen plane with two, two D coordinates of each triangle. And what is done then is line scanning. There's line scanning pixel after pixel. This is quite fast, you don't see that, but this is what happens in the GPU. So there's line scanning uh, inside the GPU for each of the triangles to fill it from point to point, and this is a simple maths when it, when it comes to rasterization. 
to fill each of those triangles on the screen, then it is projected, then you know its coordinates on screen, and then you know the texture coordinates so that you could fill in the remaining dots in within the triangle. The limitation is, of course, no matter how fast it is in GPU to process all of those triangles, the limitation is, of course, the triangle count as we are triangle bound. So the higher detail level of the model, the more triangles you have, and uh, you will have to boost up your GPU each time you're willing to render a bigger model. Another part about um, rasterization is that you have to cheat. You have to cheat quite a lot just because this is, no, this is not how the light works in the uh, real world. Uh, it doesn't project things onto your eye with the matrix information, does it? Um, this pieces of cheating code are called shaders. So we all know that there are shaders for lighting, for shadows, for depth of field. So these are essentially pieces of code that do the cheating to somehow create those missing parts and somehow fake the shadows and the lighting and everything. But the typical code working with graphics is then having some vectors, um, doing some math on those putting them onto a vector, vector vertex buffer and flushing this up into a graphics device. Rasterization is there, but recently um, ray tracing approaches also came to view and there seems to be a revival of ray tracing. Ray tracing, uh, this one for example is Arona 2, so this um, Arona 2 engine is taking a demo scene from Unity, the engine, and visualizing it not with the rasterization, but with the ray tracing algorithm, or actually GPU path tracing. Uh, Brigade, to, Brigade is also a um, ray tracing engine that you might have seen, which is also promising. This is using the GPUs and the real-time visualization of the triangular scenes. They're taking the triangular scenes, and they're using the ray tracing to visualize it. There's even um, WebGL path tracing, if you come to think of it. So it's definitely picking up in the industry. And now that the cores, the GPU cores, are much more flexible, you're able to do all kinds of computations regarding ray tracing on the GPU cores. So this is where the industry is going. And with ray tracing, of course, all the effects that are otherwise produced with shaders in rasterization are now possible color bleeding, glossiness, reflections, soft shadows, the depth of field and others. This is much, much more accessible when you have ray tracing as the uh, visualization approach. So what we want to do, we want to visualize our machines. This is the roughneck that we are producing in steel. We want to have the same roughneck visualized. And visualized probably by distributed mach uh, render machines as we have to render for quite significant uh, amounts of space in the dome screen or several screen configurations otherwise. So in this real-time screen capture that you've seen here, we are using real-time ray tracing on the actual CAD model. Just to remind you how ray tracing works, it's one of the approaches that you shoot a lot of rays photons from the light source and then they reflect from the surfaces and eventually end up in your eye, in your virtual eye, which is really, really accurate in terms of physics, but rather slow. The other approach is that you should raise from your viewer's surface from each of the pixels in there and wait for them to reflect and then see how does that turn up in relation to where the light is. So this is real time and you see that the image is somehow noisy when the camera is moving. And the answer to that is of course that well, it's simply less samples that end up in that region of space just because the camera is moving in the time frame is rather short to shoot enough rays. So as soon as the image stabilizes or the movement stabilizes, it's either the camera or the, some of the moving parts in the, uh, in the scene, then that part of the screen surface gets enough samples and that could be rendered with much higher fidelity. So this is the case with uh, ray tracing. And it's, it's not about the resolution anymore. It is about image fidelity. It's about how little noise you get on your image, regardless whether that's really small or really large. 
the model in question. The model in question is taken directly from CAD, and we are storing and representing and sending for rendering the initial CAD model, as that is crucial for us. We want to have the initial amount of level of detail. We don't want to lose any of that in adaptation or transformation. We want to be able to use the initial model. <clears throat> and <clears throat> since this is ray tracing approach, you see that this grading, for example, would be impossible to do with triangle approach. There's no way people would agree to model that with triangles, while with ray tracing, this is all the initial part. So we are no longer triangle bound, and this means that you can render one, ten, a hundred, or a thousand roughnecks in one scene with real-time performance. So this is again real-time performance of a scene with all of these roughnecks just introduced into it. And each and every one of them is, of course, still a capable CAD model. So the CAD model that has all the small details, it still has the visual fidelity, it still has all the curves. If we zoom up on the roughneck, you see that all the uh, shading, all the surface properties, uh, all the curves and all the inscriptions are still preserved. And it's a matter of throwing more GPU power to visualize with higher fidelity. If you want to get rid of the noise, you just add another GPU, and there you have it. And then again, with the ray tracing, all the lights, reflections, weather effects are, com are coming very natural. All right, so that's about the visual part. The signal flow and the data transformation. Uh, we spoke already that this control system, the, the signal translation, translate the control system language to the simulation language. And uh, the central part of this picture, when it comes to the flow, is the data transfer. So you have to uh, acquire your data and map it. Remember that you have a number of signals uh, for each of the equipment even. There's uh, hundreds of signals. And then when you come uh, to take a look at all of the equipment on one rig and even consider rig fleet and maybe several rig fleets for all the customers that we're working with, then it is thousands of signals coming in real time that you have to classify, map to a proper name, give it a proper tag, uh, uh, apply the proper archival rules, and uh, within your ontology, you will have to use some ontologies for the data. You'll have to assign types and send the signal further so it could be interpreted correctly and put into the correct place of the kinematical physics. So then the data goes into the simulation, into the kinematic simulation with the physics model that is plugged in, and then to the rendering with a graphic model is working. So, and of course, when the kinematical physics model senses something over the sensor, the signal is sent back to the, to the control system, and you have that time frame that you have to match. How is that represented if we want to build up with uh, software, software modules? How can we? There's a very good example. Uh, this, for example, is a wheel hub motor. Probably a few heard of this one. And wheel hub motor, this uh, particular one was presented by Brabus in 2011 on a motor show. This is an example of modularity. Wheel hub motor is considered to be one of the directions for the automobile industry to go in the future. This is three in one. This is the wheel, the motor, and the brakes, three in one. So a module that does not depend on the transmission that is very self-contained and easy to replace and maintain. So this is the approach that we want to apply to our roughnecks. Uh, we are actually capable of taking the real roughneck, disconnecting it, and plugging in our virtual roughneck, which is essentially a DLL. So our virtual DLL representing the virtual piece of machinery that has the very same features, the very same sensors and motors, and can behave in the very same way. So the real and the virtual counterpart, they are mutually replaceable. And the way this is built in software, when you think of that DLL, there's of course the inputs and outputs. 
inputs of your data flow mapping into your virtual motors and the outputs mapping to the data flow uh, connected to your virtual sensors. Then there is the physical representation, the course model that we spoke about that is actually meant for moving and has all the, um, all the parts, all the axes, all the shapes and all the joints. Connected to the behavior controllers as some of the movements might be more complex than just a plain A to B movement, you'll have to uh, implement more complex um, behavior for pistons and hydraulics and different parts of it which would have to be processed and maybe movement and forces are applied on a certain angle that you would have to program. And the visual representation. Visual representation of the nice graphics that is just following the lead of the physical model. And what you've seen here is the DLL. So this is the DLL that we are defining. So this DLL represents the virtual equipment. And this DLL is then put into the environment to support it to run. This is the simulation world with the, uh, with the physical rules, with the gravity and some of the traction forces, maybe with some environment. There's the visual world hosting all the visual models. So simulation world is, of course, connected to the content pipeline, standing on the rendering engine, the kinematics engine, and the data mapping that has to be there for the data acquisition and data flow. The visual world is connected to the display through the rendering protocols, and there might be some custom behavior as well as cross-cutting concerns. So types of simulation. Uh, we spoke about offline or disconnected types of simulation. This is when you do training or testing. Training, when you train your crew, when you allow your crew to train with equipment that is potentially not even produced yet. Um, training when you do these things pre-fabrication. Also testing. Uh, if you want to test your CAD designs before you send them into fabrication, if you want to test your programming for control systems for the brains of the machines before you actually deploy them, you can do all of that and do the design reviews and checks within the virtual simulation model. So that is something that you do. So both training and testing could be done pre-fabrication. Those are the disconnected scenarios. They're not connected to the actual operation. So this is when we come to the connected scenarios, when movements of equipment in 3D is following the data flow, and this is just to map the data flow, is following the actual equipment being moved offshore for monitoring or operation. As we are going into those hazardous environments, into those challenging geography regions, uh, the driller's cabin cannot be any longer located on the drill floor, and that could be too dangerous for the guys. The driller's cabin could be then moved behind the living quarters, so they don't have any visual contact anymore with the equipment, so they have to op uh, operate uh, judging by the visual video feed from the cameras and the simulated reproduced uh, equipment models that they still can observe the full models. They still can see the equipment as if through the drillers cabin, but that is the models of the equipment simulated. Uh, and taking it even further, we could take the drillers cabin and put it onshore. So there's just the connection between the drilling operation and the drillers that are similar, uh, located onshore and doing the remote operation. Let's talk about difference between gaming and simulation. Uh, simulation can be life critical, so obviously you have to put a bit of testing and quality control into what goes out of the software house in there. Uh, it's also typical that simulation features a longer life cycle for your software and technology. So while in gaming you could potentially produce an engine uh, and a game on top of that, and in five years or three years, depending on your frame, um, start re replacing that in simulation and engineering like this, you're bound by, say, service level agreements. So then in 10 or 15 years, you've got to be supporting the same code, or potentially extend, expanding it. So this puts forward some requirements. Um, the upside is, of course, that you can afford much heavier boxes when it comes to hardware uh, in simulation. So if you want to do real-time GPU ray tracing, 
uh, you're no longer bound by the concepts of an Xbox as you are in gaming. You have to rely on consumer hardware, and so you can never push that to the limit. Uh, this is different than simulations. We can really stack up the GPUs in one server rack just to provide enough graphical or simulation power for some processing to happen. Coming to visuals, of course, gaming has surpassed simulation in that. Uh, this is a demo by Jorge Jimenez. I don't know if you've seen it, but this is showing some of the really nice subsurface scattering effects on the skin. And this has been the focus of gaming, providing an eye candy and really fancy and good looking surface effects, shadow, shadowing effects, and all of that. While the focus in simulation is, of course, different, we have to look into the accuracy, how close to reality, how close is this model to what actually goes out of the fabrication. So there's a different accent on what is valued in visuals between the two worlds. Signals and controls, um, this could be seen as somewhat similar. Uh, the data amount, if you're thinking MMOs, all the massive multiplayer online games with thousands of players uh, distributed ab um, among a number of servers, this is somewhat similar to what happens when there's a number of equipment and rigs working, signals are flowing in real time, and you will have to capture them um, on the shore. Uh, then you would have to archive them, analyze, and potentially send some of the warnings and notices back. So the data amount could, could be compared uh, with these two cases. Physics and the way physics is handled in the two approaches, the gaming and the simulation. Uh, simply put, there are gaming physics engines and there are industrial physics engines. Um, well, gaming physics engines, we know, well, let's say in Bullet 3D, Bullet uh, Blender 3D uses Bullet, Unity and Unreal, they are on uh, NVIDIA's Physex, and those are quite capable and uh, good engines. The difference, the principal difference between the gaming physics and the industrial physics is that you can't really expect to put actual parameters into gaming physics engines. You can't expect to put actual weights and expect the system to operate as it would in real life. There's a whole bunch of uh, fitting and trying to find the best looking ways of working for the gaming physics, which is different for industrial. There's a whole class of problems, for example, called mass ratio problems. Uh, this is describing how um, a certain arm could be balanced. If you're thinking of a crane, this is a he heavy load suspended on a um, well, light boom, I would say. Um, this is really hard to resolve for uh, engines that uh, are not using certain types of equations or are not using the short time span for resolving those equations. So what happens in the gaming engines when you try to simulate a crane, for example, operation, it leads to instability, your scene explodes. While the industrial engines are specifically designed to accommodate for realistic and almost real uh, parameters being put into the scene. Um, just to mention that now it's uh, quite interesting as, for example, NVIDIA Flex is coming with a new simulation approach for the physical simulation. It, they're no longer suggesting to use the collision primitives as the rough shapes building up the actors. Instead, they are proposing to build up every actor in the scene from small rigid particles uniformly spaced, um, connected by joints. So with that approach, Every actor is built of those uh, parts with, um, with small particles and joints, and it makes possible to have very different types of objects interacting in the same scene, such as fluid, gas, smoke, uh, soft bodies, rigid bodies, in the same scene, interacting with each other, cloth even. Uh, if you haven't seen that, it's NVIDIA Flex, very, very interesting technology, so be sure to check it out. Before we close for today, just one more thing to mention, which is automation. Automation is about raising the effectiveness again, it's about taking the humans out of the loop. And automation has been around for many, many years, we know it in the storage, in the processing industries, um, so it's achieved on many types of operation, but it's not there yet for 
potentially dangerous operations for life critical stuff, uh, or it's somewhat there on a certain level. Uh, this is well. This is so because of the regulations and complexity of uh, the drilling, for example. And there are automation levels from one to eight. One is uh, having human fully in control, and eight is the robot doing the whole operation and not, leaven the, uh, not letting uh, personnel to interfere. Um, so we are starting to introduce some of the levels now in the industry when it comes to drilling and automated drilling. Uh, think that automation, especially of the higher levels, is benefited by simulation because when the machine is drilling and judging on the sensors and the readings, it is not just drilling the real well. On the parallel, same time, it's having a simulated process, simulated model of the same well being drilled. So all of the decisions that the machine takes are first tried out in a simulation model. This is the same that happens uh, when uh, human drillers are op operating and drilling uh, towards a complex formation as they are able to switch to a simulated model of the same formation and first try to drill through that and having found an acceptable solution they switch back and using the same controls continue to drill the actual geological formation. So that's more or less what I had uh, just to mention that simulation becomes more and more accessible and penetrates our daily lives as uh, with the drones even you can do uh, simulation now. There are drones that give you possibilities to write Python code for behavior. That's something that it runs on, uh, on your base station on your PC while the drone is out there. So there's a communication and the logic is running. So uh, people start writing already some of the guiding and autopilot routines. This is something that could be, of course, uh, tested out and uh, made sure it's using the simulation technologies. Um, so think that there's a line where the gaming stops and the simulation starts, and it's sort of a blurry line. When you have physics in the model, this is great. This, is, this means that you already have put together some simulation principles into your application. So, but it's when you put some of the hardware in the loop, when you put the actual brain or, for example, the actual uh, decision-making logic circuit into your simulation, this is when you're actually uh, coming a little bit more towards the simulation edge of it. So think about that when you program your next drone. All right, some of the keyboards uh, from uh, today's talk. So if you wanted to take some of the notes, I guess this is the time to take a screenshot of this. And that would be all questions. All right, very well. I must to remind you to use the rating system on the back. Thank you very much.